Springfield First United Methodist Church. We look forward to gather to meeting with God and worship, and we're so glad each and every one of you are here. We're grateful to welcome Ms. Uh, Reverend Hugh Barksdale and his wife, Marilyn. Uh, they're retired from the pastor from the Memphis Conference, and Hugh now resides here in Mayfield on Breast Broadway. We're very, very glad to have the Barksdale with us here today. Hugh will be bringing the message later in the service. If you're visiting with us, we want to extend a special invitation, welcome to, a special welcome to you. The church is anxious to be of help and support to you in any way possible. We invite guests and all others to use the tear-off section of your bulletin to let us know you're here, how we might pray for you, and how you might like to participate in anything the church has going on. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we have come to your house today to thank you and to offer you our praise and adoration. We want to be more like Jesus, so we have gathered in his name to worship and to hear from your holy word. We invite your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us as we worship. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
faith from Hebrews chapter 7, 23 through 28. Please follow along on the screen and read. The book of Hebrews teaches us about the supremacy of Christ, the nature of his atoning work, and his once-for-all sacrifice. Please join me as we declare that. Now there have been many earthly high priests since death prevented them from in the continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has permanent priesthood. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. So the high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for ours. He sacrificed for our sins once for all when he offered himself. The law appointed as high priest men who are weak, but God has appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. Our faith is in the perfect Son of God, Jesus Christ, our great High Priest forever. Amen. children come to the front. All young children come to the front. next Saturday. It's what? It's Halloween. How many of you have already made your pumpkins? Have you already carved your pumpkins? Do you have a pumpkin in your front yard? Not yet? 
Well, you'll get to do that this week, I'm sure. Um, I want each one of you to come up here, and let's don't take any time. Let's go very quickly. Pick out a pumpkin and then go back and sit down. Can you do that for me? Come pick out a pumpkin and then go sit back down. But you can have another one. Okay. You all are fast. I do have a big one, and I, there's a reason for this. Um, how many of you all are a pumpkin? Are any of you a pumpkin? No, but did you know you're very much like a pumpkin? Yes, you are. I want you to look at your pumpkin. Pumpkins have insides, and pumpkins have outsides. Look at all these people in this room. Do they look alike? No, we have big ones. We have little ones. We have some that have bumps on them. We have some that have spots on their skin. Some that are, yes, some have light skin and some have dark skin. And that's the same th way with pumpkins. Shh, listen. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Some, some um, pumpkins are small, some are big. Some have bumps on them. Some have spots on their skins. Some are different colors. They come in orange. They come in white. They come in green now and purple. You can get a pumpkin in a lot of different colors. So that's one way we're like pumpkins, right? We have an inside and an outside. When you got your pumpkin just now, what did you do with it? No, you didn't. You just picked it up. You held it tightly in your hands, except for one who wearing it on his head. <laughs> but you held your pumpkin tightly in your hands. And if it was a big pumpkin that you got at home, you wrapped your arms around that pumpkin, didn't you? And you kept it safe. Well, God does the same thing with us. He, when he, he picks us out, to do a special job, and he takes us, wraps his arms around us, and takes us home to clean us on the outside. This is a hard question. The next question is going to be very hard. I want somebody to think about this. When God washes us, do we know what it's called? When he washes our skin and takes off all the dirt from other people that have tried to influence us, have you ever heard the word baptism? Well, that's kind of what you do to your pumpkin when you take it home and you wash it. Um, the next thing that, that you do when you have your pumpkin at home after you've washed it is you're going to scoop all the yuck out from inside, right? You take all that yuck that's inside if you're going to turn it into a jack-o'-lantern. God takes all the yuck out of us, too. He, ta he opens us up, and he removes all the seeds of doubt. He removes hate and greed. Anyone, anyone can clean out a pumpkin, but only God can clean out our hearts, right? Yep. A pumpkin that has all the gunk out of it is hollow on the inside. <clears throat> well, that's, it didn't break, did it? Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. So when you take your pumpkin home and you clean it out, the next thing you do is you're going to put a happy face on it, aren't you? A smiley face. And then you put a candle on the inside so that it can shine. God does the same thing for us. He cleans all that yucky stuff out. He puts a happy face on us. And he puts a light in our heart so that we can show everybody what he has done for us. So, are you like a pumpkin? Yes, you are. But 
The only difference is God can shine in your light all in your life all the time. A pumpkin's good for a couple or three weeks, but God is in your life. So when somebody, and this, you're going to have to practice this with me, when somebody comes up to you, and I hope there'll be people today and next week that will say to you, hey, pumpkin, how you doing? Has any, have any of you ever been called pumpkin? I was when I was a little girl. But if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, pumpkin, how are you doing? This is what I want you to say. I'm doing great. I'm a child of God. Can you practice that for me really loud? I'm doing great. Loud. Let them hear you in the back. I'm doing great. I'm a child of God's. Thank you. We're going to go to Children's Church now. What? I don't think so today. There's not enough for two, I don't think. We'll go in Children's Church and see. I'll show you in Children's Church. We're always thankful to have the children and all the people that help uh, mold them into fine young Christians. Uh, like for everyone in their thoughts and prayers this week, please be with uh, the tragedy that happened in Oklahoma with the parade and, and that uh, mishap that happened doing that. I, I think five or six were killed and several injured, so please keep those in your prayers. And also the families dealing with Hurricane Patricia. Uh, I want to announce too that Joe and Liz are seeing their, uh, Joe's family and he wanted me to pass along to you that they had an outstanding and he said it was an awesome 90th birthday party for his father. So we're so thankful they were able to be there and enjoy that with his father. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have offered yourself to us. You're rich in mercy and your grace meets us at the point of our deepest need. May we be for the world as you have been towards us. We pray that you will bless this offering and use these gifts which represent our hearts to further your kingdom's work. In Christ's holy name, we pray.
gospel lesson today comes from uh, the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Listen to the words from Mark. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind, the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. Everybody awake? Too early for a nap? It's good to be with you this day. Please don't expect me to play and sing like Joe and Liz. You'll be very disappointed. You'd be even more disappointed if I played like Joe and Liz. <laughs> I had a former choir director ask me several times not to sing in the choir. I know some of you, and some of you know me. Just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Everybody will catch on sooner or later. It's good to be back. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for bringing us here today. We thank you for this gathering of your saints. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us to come together in your house, to pray, to praise, to sing, to shout, to ask, to beg. Send your spirit. Fill this place. And fill us. And be with us as we look into your word so that whatever we speak and hear, it will be your truth, and your truth only. Amen. You've all heard this narrative before. The narrative about blind Bartimaeus. There are even songs about blind Bartimaeus. Some pretty good ones. So it's not an unfamiliar story, if you will, but I, I, I want to take just a moment and, and think about the setting of, of the story. Last week's uh, lesson, uh, somehow or another, touched on James and John as they came to Jesus one day and, they, and they, they said to Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you to do. <laughs> well, those of you who have children, understand the danger of that. But Jesus said, that's not going to happen. So he's trying to teach his disciples some things. All the time Jesus is walking around, he's teaching and he's preaching and he's healing and, and he's doing the things that Jesus did. You know, he's not, he's not static. He's not staying in one place. He's working the road. He's working the streets. He's up and down through there all the time. And, and, and he's got people with him People follow him. You know, he has an entourage. But when he gets to Jericho, it's a little different. Jericho is a strange place, and, and, and there were a lot, a lot of rabbis in Jericho. And because, you don't need this lecture probably, but I'm going to do it anyway. I've got the time. Not all the rabbis worked at the same time. Generally speaking, they kind of worked in shifts, if you will, so that not all of them were on duty at one time. But this is a special occasion because people are making their way toward Jerusalem for the Passover. And that's why Jesus is going there, even though he knows his purpose and his mission is just a little bit different from that. And it's not going to have a real happy ending because his journey is going to end at the cross. Amen? Well, thank you very much. Even Methodists can say amen. So everybody's in the game. And all the priests right now are on duty because it is the Passover and because all of them are supposed to make their way to Jerusalem for that Passover. Not all of them did, and not all the people did. It's just impossible. So they would stand by the roads and and, and, and on the streets, and, and they would encourage and, and, and visit with and talk with and, and, and wish well those people who were going to Jerusalem. So there's a great throng of people there, not just Jesus and his entourage, but all these other folks. And some of them were probably really glad to see Jesus. And they were probably clapping and yelling and, and, and saying nice things, but then there was all those other folks 
and those other rabbis, and Jesus had been stepping on all her toes, who, who Jesus was, and probably they weren't applauding him. I don't know if they were booing him, but there certainly were some cold stares out there. But Jesus is doing what Jesus does. Jesus is walking and talking and teaching and preaching. And then there's blind Bartimaeus. We don't know a great deal about Bartimaeus. We don't know that he was blind from birth. It appears from, from the narrative that he probably was. But at this point, he is blind. And in that society, that was an awful, awful thing. Bartimaeus was the lowest of the low, the least of the least. He was an outcast. He wasn't just on the margins. He was back out away from the margin. He was a nobody, a nothing, a faceless, nameless, soulless person as far as those people around him were concerned. He was absolutely nothing. And the only way he could live was to stand by the side of the road or sit by the side of the road and beg. Now, we don't know how he heard about Jesus. We don't know exactly what he knew about Jesus. He obviously knew enough to know who he was because of the way he addresses him. And he had obviously had some contact with somebody who knew something about what Jesus had been doing, especially the miracles that he had been performing. Other than that, we don't know. And here is blind Bartimaeus. And if you will, it's a fourth and ten for Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is hopeless and helpless. And here comes this man down the road named Jesus. And he yells to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And of course the disciples, being the cool guys that they are, tell him, oh, shut up, Bartimaeus. <laughs> Get out of the way. Quit bothering the man. You know better than that. And he just gets louder and louder. He's insistent and persistent. And they keep telling him, sit down and shut up. But he won't do it. And finally, he raises a, 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 enough, enough noise that, that Jesus says, I'm going to talk to him. So they go to him and say, get up, get up. The man wants to see. And Bartimaeus jumps off and he shucks off his cloak. Probably the only other piece of clothing that he had to his name and he goes to Jesus and Jesus asks Bartimaeus what can I do for you? What can I do for you? The NIV translates the reply as saying, and Bartimaeus says, I want to see. Some other translations uh, treat that a little differently, and I actually like them better because they say, Bartimaeus said, my prayer is that I may see. My prayer is that I may see. And Jesus, without hesitation, looks into his heart looks into his soul, looks into the very depth of his being, and he tells Bartimaeus, go, your faith has healed you. Please note that Jesus does not just say the power of God has healed you. He does not say that I, Jesus of Nazareth, son of David, Son of God, Son of Man, have healed you. He says to Bartimaeus, your faith has healed you. And Bartimaeus could see. And the 
the scripture tells us that he followed him down the road. Didn't even go back to get his cloak. Just followed him down the road. I don't know how far Bartimaeus followed Jesus. I like to think that Bartimaeus followed Jesus all the way to the cross. Amen. He was grateful because he knew something about the gift he had received. But he also learned a great deal about himself, that it was his faith that helped. Bartimaeus may have learned something that we need to learn from that too, and that is that faith, that wonderful abiding knowledge of things that we neither know nor understand, but believe so deeply that they are a very core of our being. He knew something about faith, and therefore he knew something about himself. He learned about himself. You know, one of the things that we, we often do, we look at Jesus and the miracles, and, and we go, oh, we're, we, you know, we're all struck by that, and I, I am too. But one of the things we don't pay as much attention to sometimes as we ought, I think, is, is that those miracles are connected to people. It's the people who end up being the miracles. It's not just the miracles. Didn't, Jesus didn't do those miracles just to do a miracle. He did those miracles because this was part of his mission. He had come to this world to save us. He had come to heal the sick, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to free the prisoners, to make the lame to walk and the blind to see. That's who Jesus was. It was a Jesus thing, but it's not just about Jesus. It's about the people. It's about us. It's not just the miracle, and all of those have something to do with faith. Sometimes it may just be that Jesus has the faith that he can perform the miracle. But look at the people, and especially somebody like Bartimaeus, who here was at, at, at a crossroads, if you will. He was on those, he, he was at fourth and ten on this. This is the last play of the game. He's going to win or lose. He's, he's put everything out there. And this is it. This is a pivotal moment for Bartimaeus. His life will not ever be the same. He's gone as low as he can go. The only way is up, and Jesus is there in his love, his mercy, and his grace to lift him up and make him somebody that he never had been before. What a great and glorious miracle. Amen? Jesus offers us the same miracle in our own lives every day. I grew up in a small uh, community in southeastern Colorado, Rocky Ford, Colorado, cantaloupe capital of the world. There was a blind man who lived across the street from us at one time, a really nice guy. He had lost his sight during World War II. He ran a stand downtown, such as it was, sold magazines, newspapers, candy, chewing gum, little notions. You know, some of you don't remember any stands like that, but some of you do. There used to be, you know, it's just a little corner operation, just a little booth kind of thing. And I never knew of him to make a mistake in making change. Now, he was blind. You could try. He, he could even figure out you're trying to hand him some foreign money of some kind or another. Never heard of him making a mistake. I knew of people who thought he made a mistake, but he didn't. There was a bank right next door to his little place. And they would, on occasion, go to him so he could check to see if they had gotten some funny money. He could tell whether or not it was real or counterfeit. 
And he was better than the bank people at it. He got robbed one time. He gave the police a description. My father happened to be on the police department at that time. And, and they gave, he, he gave them a description. Now, he couldn't tell them what the guy looked like. He's not going to be able to produce an artist's sketch, but he could tell them what he was wearing. Not necessarily the colors, but he could tell, he told them what kind of clothes he had on and told them he was wearing, he was wearing boots. And, and two or three other, they caught the guys the same day. Caught by a blind man. My wife reminded me yesterday of a friend of ours, <laughs> a dear friend of ours down in Tennessee who happens to be uh, also a minister. She is legally blind. A few months ago, she got her driver's license back. Is that scary? And if you knew her, it would be even scarier. She has been known to use automobiles as weapons, but that's another story altogether. Now, I, I, you know, we never know exactly how we see. When I was in Vietnam many, many years ago, I got sent out one night, went out with some other folks, and I, I, had to, I was on guard duty, didn't have to be, but I chose to be, and, and, and the sergeant who was in charge uh, of, of this, a, a guy who was, he was a full-blooded Blackfoot Indian, and, and he, he knew more, he, he should have had a PhD in jungle warfare. And he sent me out on this thing in, in, uh, to a listening post. How many, any of you been in the military know what a listening post is? Well, that's when they send you out some far, some ways in front of the perimeter and they put you out there and you're not supposed to look at things, you're supposed to listen for things. It's a listening post. And he sent me out there and blindfolded me. Sent me out with someone else, but he blindfolded me and I stayed out there for two hours, blindfolded, and then had to go back. And I had to make it back by myself. And I asked him, Sergeant, why'd you do that? Why do I have to stay blindfolded? And he said, as he often did later, he said to me, Now, Barksdale, you're supposed to be an intelligent man. What are you supposed to be doing out there? And I said, listening. And he said, exactly. You're not supposed to be looking. You're not supposed to be watching. Your eyes will fool you. Especially you get out in the dark in the middle of the night in the middle of a jungle, your eyes will see things that are not even there. That's happened to some of you for one reason or another. I won't go, you know. But your ears don't. Listen, he said, and you will live. It's the same thing Jesus often said listen, and you will live. Which brings me to the title of this thing. If you looked in your bulletin, it says, the title for this discourse is Blind as a Bat. Of course you know that bats are not really blind. You do know that, don't you? I mean, they do have eyes. But that's not the wonderful thing about bats, is it? Bats have this radar, sonar kind of thing built into them that that's like none other, and, and, and they can fly at, at, at really great speeds in very close contact with a multitude of other bats, and they never fly into each other. They never run into anything as long as the signals are clear. Everything is good, and they... But they may be in complete darkness. So, you know, when you say blind is a bat, it's not necessarily negative. That's kind of positive, after all. And, and, and in so many ways, Bartimaeus was blind as a bat because Bartimaeus saw things differently. He saw them in a different way. He did not see them through his optic nerves and through the irises in his eyes. He did not see that way. What he saw was through the eyes of faith. 
He was not encumbered by all of those distractions and things that so easily get our attention, the bright lights and all of that stuff. Bartimaeus, no way he could not see those with his physical eyes. What he could see was with his eyes of faith. And his eyes of faith told him, this is Jesus of Nazareth. And he can do something that nobody else can do. And I'm going to see that he helps me. If it's the last thing I do, it's fourth and ten for Bartimaeus. And he puts it all out there. You know, he, for, for doing what he did, he could have been stoned. Bartimaeus finally makes it to Jesus. And Jesus doesn't tell him, what are you doing in? Why are you bothering me? Who do you think you are? Like we probably would. Jesus instead says to Bartimaeus, what can I do for you? And Bartimaeus says, I just want to see. My prayer is that I will see. And through his faith, Jesus says, he got to see. He did not see with his eyes. He saw with his heart and his soul, with his faith, beyond that kind of normal vision that we see normally in our lives. You know, we're, we get distracted so, so easily. We don't often see with those eyes of faith, not nearly like we used to. We don't really lay it out there like we ought to. We spend a lot of time, you'll pardon me, you know, when, when, when I talked to Joe about being here today, I asked him, I said, Joe, do you want me to talk to him? you want me to preach to him? And he said, well, you do what you think is right. So I'm going to start meddling because I just love to meddle. Well, we all like that, don't we? And you might say you're preaching to the choir. Huh? I don't mind preaching to the choir. We get so distracted by all those worldly things around us that we forget what we're supposed to be doing. We forget what our objective is. We forget what our mission is. You know, I, I, I was so saddened uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago about the death of Yogi Berra, one of America's great philosophers and a great communicator. <laughs> I love some of those yogiisms, you know. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. It ain't over till it's over. But one of my favorite ones is, it, 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 I'm, I'm going to tell you in just a moment, it, it, it pertains to us. It's how we operate. It's what we're doing so much of our lives. And that one says, I don't know where we're going, but we're making really good time. What are we doing? We spend sometimes so much time playing at church that we don't really do church. We spend so much time sometimes just playing with the gospel that we don't do the gospel. We spend so much time sometimes just talking about faith that we don't do faith. Faith is not, faith is not just a, a state of being. It's a, it is partly a state of, of being, but not altogether. It's also a state of doing. Faith makes us do. We got to do faith. Those things which are, are inculcated in our hearts and our souls and our minds by the teachings of Jesus, by the power and the wonder of the grace and mercy of God, by living in the love that promises to save us. That's where our faith is supposed to be. Why don't we use it? What are we doing with it? Are we really out there putting ourselves on the line? If this church disappeared from the world today, 
Would anybody miss us? What are we doing? Where, where are our eyes of faith? We can't just talk about it. We got to do it. One of the things that I, I, I is at the very core of nearly everything that, that, I, that, that I ever try to teach and preach is that we've got to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing else really matters. And Jesus tells us very clearly, unless you love me most, you're not going to make it to heaven. Now, it's really clear. There are no ifs, no ands, no ors, no buts. There are no amendments, no changes, no codicils. There's nothing else there. Jesus just tells us, you got to live that first and the greatest commandment. You've got to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all of your energy, with all that you are and all that you have. You've got to love God. And the second is likened to it, you've got to love each other. And you've got to love everybody the same as much as you love yourself. But we don't. We don't live that. We're blinded. We can't, we can't see through the darkness of the world. We, uh, somehow our radar gets kicked off. We don't see those things. We, we let them become the predominant things in our lives and we pursue the wrong things. Bartimaeus knew exactly what he wanted and that's what he asked for and that's what he got. Is there a lesson there? I think there is. But we get distracted do, do we ask that we, that we find something to do for God? Something good to do in his name every day? Or, or, or do, we, do we just ask? Maybe we don't ask at all. Maybe that's the problem. But we get so wrapped up in, in what we're doing in our careers, in our families, in our, in, in our jobs, in our acquaintances, in the social media in, in making more money and having a bigger house and buying a new car and doing all these other things. Even if we do some of the things that we're supposed to do to help others, we're still not putting it out there all the way, all the time, in every way, like Jesus would have us to do. And I'm just as guilty of it as anybody else. Don't get me wrong. I always preach these things to myself first. Our eyes of faith are blinded too. We can't even see as well as Bartimaeus could see. We've gotten to the point, I'm afraid, where faith becomes a convenience and not a necessity. For Bartimaeus, it was a necessity. In some ways, his faith was born out of desperation because Jesus was his last good hope. But I've got to tell you, my friends, we're all in the same state of desperation that Bartimaeus was. Jesus is still our last best hope. And I don't care who you are, where you are, what you're doing. If you haven't had those times when you were in the darkest well at the worst possible time, in the worst possible way, you will be there. And the question is whether or not your eyes of faith are strong enough to see that you can get out of that. And there's only one good way to see and to get out of that. And what we have to do is listen when Jesus asks us, as he does every day, what can I do for you? Every day, we are sitting by the side of life's road just like Bartimaeus was. We are poor, dejected, rejected, discarded in so many ways, no matter who we are, no matter what our place in society, we're still that way. And Jesus is always there asking us, what can I do for you? Not just what can you do for me, but what Jesus asks us, what can I do for 
you. And I think, friends, our reply probably should be the same reply that Bartimaeus had. Jesus, I want to see. I want to see who I'm supposed to be. I want to see what I'm supposed to do. I want to see so I can go where I need to go. Open my eyes that I may see. You know, I, I think so often of that wonderful one of the most often used hymn perhaps in all the world. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now, now, with the grace, the love, and the mercy of Jesus Christ, and the love of God, I can see. Where are you? Are your eyes open? Can you see? Do you want to see? Only you can answer that question. Only you can pick yourself up from the side of the road and run to Jesus. And he'll be waiting, and he'll ask you. If you'll just listen, he will ask you, what can I do for you? Yeah, Bartimaeus had a fourth and 10. We have a fourth and 10. Here's the good news. Jesus never has a fourth and 10. Jesus doesn't have to worry about winning the game. Jesus is the game. Paul tells us that we should know, we should see. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
our coming to you. In faith, we ask you to heal us from our spiritual blindness. Let us be persistent in our cries of mercy to you, for you listen. 